All right, folks, welcome back. Sheepdog Smokey here, and I'm changing up my presentation a little bit because, uh, as I've told you before, I went to school to become a teacher, uh, and this is how I taught. I Granted, was this a classroom, you would see me, but I work best when I bring up a lesson. Now, recently, uh, Robert Francis O'Rourke, uh, Beto, as he likes to be called, decided to officially weigh in and say that any church that does not, as I call it, toe the liberal line on gay marriage and homosexuality should lose their tax-exempt status. Now, what does this mean and what are all of the facets of it? And that's what we're going to be looking at today, because this is not a clear-cut, everybody will or everybody won't. This is a very multifaceted issue. So let's dive right in. When we look at it, the Constitution, of course, has the First Amendment, beginning out, because it does involve five actual rights, but it starts with Congress shall make no law respecting establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Often this is taken as the infamous separation of church and state. Uh, many people will often cite the, quote, wall of separation, but nowhere in the Constitution does that appear, nor in the Declaration. That is just a fallacy. It Literally, the only time it's mentioned is the above phrase. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. The famous wall of separation comment is in a letter from Thomas Jefferson to the Danbury Baptists. And this is very early on in the life of our country. In fact, he was referring to the wall of separation to protect the church from government and not the other way around. There is no separation in the Constitution other than telling Congress they may not legislate religion. Freedom of religion does not also mean freedom from religion, and that's often, often used, it's very commonly used uh, and wrongly used, to demand that people of faith hide their faith. Uh, we hear regularly that Chick-fil-A is a horribly cult-followed, bigoted restaurant, when if any of these people would simply go to a Chick-fil-A and not be themselves, as we saw from the famous video where the guy pulls through to get water and says, I'm doing this to waste your time and to waste your water and make you pay for it. If he would have just gone in, ordered food, sat, and eaten, he would have, one, eaten some very good food. He would have also been treated very, very well by the employees. I have never never seen a Chick-fil-A employee treat anyone other than with complete respect and honesty. They're just great people. But that is what people want to scream, is freedom of religion and freedom from religion. There is nothing in the founding documents of this country that says you have a right to silence anyone else because their faith is not yours. And that's what we have to get back to. My carrying a Bible or wearing a cross or praying over my lunch when I'm out in public, discussing religion with someone where you happen to be within earshot does not violate any of your rights. You trying to silence me violates mine because I have a right to freely express my faith. You don't have to be involved. You can ignore me. But this is not what people want. They want total control. When you look at the current agenda of virtually every Democrat running for office, it is to force the gay agenda, meaning everyone must sanction gay marriage. That's where they run to. It is to force socialism. It is to force gun control and so many other things. There's no freedom in any of that. And this one is, to me, the most worrying because this might actually make it past some of the checks and balances that it should not, whereas other things won't. But let's look at what the Bible says. Romans 1, 26-28 refers directly to shameful lusts, and it names them. It says the women were lying with women, the men would lie with men. And in this one it says that God gave them over to that. There is a part of prophecy that God will harden some people's hearts. An omniscient God knows if you are ever going to be redeemed. And in some cases, God will harden some people's hearts. He will give you over or give them over 
to the shameful lusts. We look at Mark, Matthew 10, 6-9. This is the actual verse that has, I believe, been made in the song. I'm not 100% because I'm not up to uh, speed on my 60s music. But this is, For a man will leave his father and mother and go to his wife, and the two shall travel on as one flesh. Very clearly states, man and wife, father and mother. It does not say partner and partner. And this is, one, grounded in biology. Without external help, be that a fertility clinic, be that in vitro fertilization, a surrogate, or any other external help, two people of the same biological sex cannot conceive a child. Now, sex is enjoyable. Okay, it is pleasurable. But, very simply, sexual relations are procreation. Meaning that you are doing this, and it is meant to help you conceive a child. And two men or two women cannot do that without external help. A woman cannot conceive a child without biological material from a biological male. It's simply physically impossible. There is one recorded case in all of Christian history of divine conception. And uh, quite honestly, I don't see that happening again. Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13. The famous story of Sodom and Gomorrah, where we get the term sodomy from. In this story, you have Lot and his wife, who were in the city of Sodom, and they were visited by angels, telling them to get out because God was going to destroy the, the entire city. While there, men bang, began banging on Lot's door, saying that they wanted to him to send out the men. And this is often misinterpreted because you don't often go back to the original language of the text. But people will say, oh, they just wanted to know who they were. It says, Let it, we, want to, we want to know them. No, the actual literal translation is we wish to know them carnally. Literally translated, they wanted to have sex with the men. Lot offered his daughters. Why would he offer up his daughters if people just wanted to get to know his visitors? He offered up his daughters to s try to save the city, and they refused. Lot, his wife, and his children left. Ultimately, his wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt. But you can see in both of these that it is called detestable. If a man has sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. In another translation, it is called an abomination. This is the only time I know of in the Bible when an act is literally called an abomination. Now, the next argument people will make is that in the Old Testament, uh, we have things where polyester would not be allowed or eating certain foods together is not allowed. The Old Testament as a whole was not invalidated when Christ said the law has been fulfilled. When we look at the New Testament, Kashrut law, which prevents eating shellfish or pork, certain things together. In his vision, Peter had a sheet descend from heaven where all of the food was unclean, and he was told, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he argued that he was not allowed to, and God said, the voice said, what I have made clean is not unclean. It's very simple. This has never been called complete and full and anything else. It is because you can see it in Romans and in Mark. It is still what was taught. It still applies. The only exception to any Old Testament law or rule is one that has specifically been called fulfilled. The law has been fulfilled. And people refer to that. They talk about when Christ said the law has been fulfilled in him. That is the prophetic law, the messianic prophecies. But we look at, and this is something that has been done before. When we look at Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, King Nebuchadnezzar had decreed that he should be worshipped as a god. He basically stole the first commandment. Thou shalt have no gods before me. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused, and they were tossed into a furnace. At 
a later point, someone looked into the furnace and witnessed four people, not three, walking in the flames unharmed. It's later revealed that they were visited by who they claimed to be the Messiah, uh, and or claimed to be God, and they were saved. Just three chapters later, King Darius, uh, and this is one, I've only ever had one person say this to me, but it is something I'll bring up. Modern Hollywood showed King Darius with his son Xerxes in the second uh, 300 movie. And they had Darius killed, which drove Xerxes mad, and so on and so forth. The historical personage of Darius and Xerxes is based on real people. Xerxes did not gain supernatural power afterwards. He simply became a madman. But King Darius decreed that for 30 days no one may pray to any god at all basically said, you're going to be atheist for a month. Daniel regularly, before that point, prayed with his windows open. He refused to stop and was cast into the lion's den. Now, this is a common practice in this era. It was a common practice in Rome, where lions would be starved for not a long time. They still had to have their strength, but they would be literally just ravenous and turned on someone be it for entertainment as they did in Rome, or just as punishment as was done for Daniel. But in that story, God shut the lion's mouths. Darius would look and see the lion's lying contentedly and da Daniel unharmed. Ultimately, this reconciled Daniel to Darius and was used by Daniel to witness. But all of these things come together to show that leaders who do not know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Christianity, often will use religion for their own benefit. When we look at the biggest reason for the First Amendment, when we look at the Founding Fathers, it is the Church of England. Very famously, King Henry VIII wanted to divorce one of his wives and was told no. And he said, well, we will have our own church where divorce is allowed. Ultimately, how he became... Henry, uh, how he became the butt of the joke of the song, Henry VIII. But he want, there was a ruler, a British king, wanted to divorce his wife, was told no by the church, split from the church, and started his own, the Anglican Church, Church of England. And this ultimately led to the king of England, a secular ruler, having just ultimate control over the church. And the founders realize this is wrong. The church should answer only to God. And when the Quakers left, and ultimately as others left, in the colonies, they didn't enforce this. And ultimately, after the American Revolution, it's enshrined in the First Amendment that Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Pardon me. Now, moving on to tax exemption. Should churches even be tax exempt? Well, they are set up as a 501c3 nonprofit organization. They do not profit. Now, when you look at point three, mega churches, I don't like them. Yes, the church I currently attend has a rather large building, but could not be considered a mega church. The gymnasium, for example, is it rivals any high school gymnasium at this time at the time. But it's also used to allow basketball groups that are not part of the church to practice. Upward basketball, very famous, very, uh, most, most of the time. But it, they've only grown as far as the congregation requires. My parents attend a very small church, uh, and the building has been there likely longer than I've been alive. But they look at these mega churches, and they see these people making all this money, and they think the church is profiting. No, the employees are, but that is not a violation of a 501c3. Many 501c3s have people who make a lot of money for running the show. But when we look at it, this rule would apply to three, maybe just one or two more, but to the big three faiths, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Because Judaism and Christianity both pull from Leviticus, Christianity also from uh, Mark, and Islam pulls from the Quran, and all of them do this. Now, of course, Beto does not mention Islam, but 
it's, it would be very interesting for someone to ask him. But why would the Baptist church lose their tax-exempt status when a Presbyterian church, which allows for gay marriage, does not? Or the Church of Satan, the Luciferian religion. They, of course, allow gay marriage, so they would not be ta lose their tax exemption. This would be a rule favoring some churches over others and be blatantly unconstitutional. But we know this might actually be tried. So what would happen? If you happen to have read Revelation, you know that in the end days, we're going to see basically the worst period of human history possible before the end of all things, before the millennial kingdom of a thousand year reign under Christ and then eternity in paradise. But we've seen famine, plagues, wars and rumors of wars for all hundreds and hundreds of years. Prior to Constantine and his Reformation, the Roman Empire regularly would put Christians into the Colosseum, and they would be fed to the lions, or they would be made to fight someone who was very highly trained in gladiatorial combat, and this is how they were entertaining their people. Uh, they did have other slaves that would fight each other just slave on slave, but this is how Christians were executed. But this doesn't, if it happens, this won't end the church as an entity. It will end some individual churches, but those are individual entities in one city at one specific location that will just decide, fine, we're done. But if we look at it, not all of them will. Not very long ago, because 244, 243 years is a very short time in human history, but even in our own country's history, churches were not always exempt from taxation, and they still had them. You would have someone who owned the land, and they would allow a church to be built on it. The pastor was not paid, but he had food directly provided to him. If he needed transportation, it was provided. If he had a place to live provided to him. Basically, instead of paying the pastor a salary, they were completely dependent upon the congregation. In my town, there is still the old parsonage, and it was in my mother's, uh, I believe her teen years, maybe shortly after, that the pastor said he wished to purchase the parsonage because he didn't want to leave the town. Uh, basically, he was getting on in years and knew that when he retired, he would have to buy a house, and they liked the parsonage. So the parsonage in my town actually existed into the 1960s and 1970s, and the church allowed them to live there rent and utility free, and that was a portion of their pay. If there's a problem in the building, members of the congregation would just show up and fix it. Or, if in the case of today, they would band together to, buy, to pay for a contractor. Any property taxes, of course, would be the same. The community would just come together, and as opposed to the offerings given in Sunday service and donations to the church, it would simply be everybody comes together, figures out exactly how much is needed, they all come up with it, and one person goes and pays the property tax because that private person actually owns that land. So where does this leave us? Well, currently, as I said, it's unconstitutional to do this. Revoking tax exemption status from... Only those churches who do not sanction gay marriage would basically be saying tax exemption is a benefit to any church that obeys me, and anyone who doesn't is punished by not receiving it. Well, that is respecting some establishments of religion, and that is not allowed. It's irrelevant. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, those three faiths together comprise the vast majority of people on earth, and all three teach that homosexuality is wrong. As I said, this is supported biologically. Without any help, two men or two women cannot conceive a child. Okay? And this, I realize some people are going to say that a trans woman before surgery could, father, could help her, uh, her lesbian lover conceive a child or her trans male partner conceive a child. Well, no, that's physically not the same thing. That is a biological male and a 
biological female. This is not going into what the left currently demands we accept that there are un unlimited genders possible. This is physical biology. Two people who are biologically the same sex, two biological males or two biological females, cannot conceive a child. You need one of each. And it, for centuries we've had governments that overstep their bounds and they try to rule over their people. Okay, Rome, prior to roughly 333 with Constantine and his dream that conversion to Christianity would ensure his armies won, persecuted Christians. They met in people's homes and they fellowshiped. And then after that, they became the church. But then we get the Protestant Reformation with Martin Luther, basically saying, listen, we're, we've got it. we're doing just the same thing that governments have done. We're now saying that men can decide what is and is not right. They can speak for God. And that's not, a, that's not right in any way. God speaks for God. Then we have the Church of England. Now we have the various denominations of Christianity. But it always comes back to when something happens, people will persevere. They will find a way around certain things. If by some fluke we, we see both houses of Congress and the White House and ultimately the Supreme Court all controlled by liberals and this happens, the church in my town may close down. My congregation that I officially am a member of may, may close, my parents as well. There's no law saying people can't gather in my home. I'm not tax exempt. I pay property taxes. I pay sales taxes. I pay income taxes. It's very simple. That's the way it works. So they're not granting me anything because I'm not a church. I'm a Christian. And if I want to have people over to study the Word of God, that's fine. If this happens and someone actually does say that this mosque must close, members of that mosque can meet in someone's home. If a synagogue is forced to close, those people can meet in someone's home. We will still see the church as an overarching entity continue. It will just be a much larger number of very small groups as opposed to a much smaller number of very large groups. I understand that not everyone who watches my videos is Christian. In fact, I want that because, one, I am called to witness. And if this sparks a question in someone and they start talking and it goes down that road, that's a good thing. But it also sparks debate. This is very clear. The First Amendment states you may not have any law that allows a benefit to only some faiths, but not all. This would be a punishing of some faiths by granting a benefit only to those who obey what Robert O'Rourke wants them to. It's a blatant violation of the First Amendment. My wearing a Christian t-shirt to a public, public place is not. My praying in public is not. This is. But it also is very likely that one day it will, whether in my lifetime or not. And like I said, the church as an overarching entity, an overarching body of believers will continue. We will see it return at that time to what it was in the pre-Constantine Constantine era, where believers met in someone's home, and they would fellowship over a meal, and they would learn and, and just work together. And it, that can't be stopped. Not without just brutal subjugation of the people where you have thousands upon thousands of jackboots in every corner of the country kicking in doors and arresting people for praying. And, you know, honestly, at that point, we've pretty much lost the entire battle for the planet. But enough about that. I do want to know what you think. I would love to hear from you. Also, I would love to make sure that I say, because I'm supposed to every time apparently, make sure to like the video and make sure to subscribe. This is really kind of going to be what I try to do from here on. I may react to a news story. I may react to 
something else. I may do a pop culture video where I talk about a movie. I mean, I love certain genres of movies, so if I see one, I may do a review on it. But ultimately, I studied to become a teacher. I studied to be an educator. And when I see comments like a work made where he says, yes, churches who do not sanction gay marriage should lose their tax-exempt status. I can't let that go. That is the most blatant way you can say, I don't care what the First Amendment says. I expect no less from O'Rourke, a drunk driving, accident scene fleeing, breaking and entering, fanta guy who fantasized about murdering children. He admitted he fed his wife a verdant turd. This is someone who I expect far more insanity from, but this, from someone who claims to want to, to be the most powerful person in the country? No, this has to be called out. If he was going after any other faith and saying that Luciferians cannot teach this or Muslims cannot teach that or Buddhists cannot do this or Hindus must eat beef, I would tear him the same exact way. Because that is still the same level of violation of the First Amendment. You cannot pass any law that respects an establishment of religion or prohibits the free exercise thereof. What that means is any and all laws must apply to literally every faith in the country. You want to make one tax exempt, they're all tax exempt. You want to take it away, take it away from them all. And honestly, I expect them to try. I expect one of the Democrats in power to try, and I expect to see a lot of whining and gnashing of teeth on every news show there is about how they're just not being allowed to do what they need to do. But, again, I've talked long enough on this. Make sure, again, to like and subscribe so you stay up to date with all of the new content. Let me know what you think of the new format so that I know if you want to try this, keep going with this or not, and I will talk to you guys next time. Have a great week.